Well, it's great to be back in, uh, in Delhi, where I was living in 2005 when the first ASA report came out, and so have now been sort of thinking and about the ASA results off and on for six, eight years now. Um, and hence, it's time to start thinking, what does this process look like? Uh, when are we going to see the impact uh, of the excitement and enthusiasm that goes into ASER? And I think for that, I want to talk about the difference between linear and nonlinear processes. So a linear process, it, the kind of more you do, the more you get. You push a little bit, you get a little bit. You push a little harder, you get a little bit further. So to illustrate, you know, if I have three rocks in my pocket, um, which I just happen to have, um, <laughs> naturally. Um, we know that if I kind of throw the rock with not a lot of force, it doesn't go very far. And we know with a rock of roughly similar magnitude, if I throw it harder, it goes further. And if I throw it very hard, someone's going to get hurt because um, it's going to go very far. And we would know that if I pull out a larger rock, <laughs> from my pocket, which naturally is there. Um, we know that by the nature of a linear process, if I put the same effort into moving a larger rock as a smaller rock, I'll get less movement out of the rock. So if I toss it, it is also not going to go very far. So linear processes are fun. We like linear processes because they're easy to understand, easy to get feedback on. We put a little effort in, we get a little output out, we see what's going on. We know whether or not what we're, what we're working, what we're doing is working in some sense almost immediately. Now, a nonlinear process can often involve very disruptive, sudden changes from what looks like roughly the same amount of effort. So you can put effort in and not get anything, you can put effort in and not get anything, and suddenly, and again, if we don't actually understand the underlying science, suddenly, suddenly, miraculously, things start to happen. But it isn't miraculous that things started to happen. It was the cumulative result of reaching the threshold that we needed to be at. So I wanted to illustrate uh, a disruptive nonlinear process. And a great example of a nonlinear process is when things break. So I decided not to use his glass. Um, <laughs> to illustrate a nonlinear process of breaking, but they happen to supply me with a ribbon. And it's the same sort of thing. You know, a ribbon has a certain integrity, and if we tug on it in a certain way and with a certain force, it doesn't rip. But once the process of ripping starts, it can actually then unravel, and this isn't going to work, as the, but it can actually then unravel very fast. So I'm going to use a different example <laughs> with a piece of paper. You know, if I tug on a piece of paper a certain magnitude, it doesn't rip, it doesn't rip. Once it starts to rip, the rest of the rip happens very fast because the underlying resistance loses its integrity. There's a phase transition, and the same amount of force produces dramatically more results. So why am I talking about linear and nonlinear processes? Well, because I think the process of ASER itself is contributing to what ultimately will be a nonlinear process. So it would be easy to say, well, geez, you've done the test uh, eight years now. When are we going to see results? Or, and it's very difficult to know. You know, with a linear process, you would say, if we've pushed for eight years and it hasn't moved, we should stop pushing. I think that's exactly the wrong attitude. Because if you continue pushing, Eventually, you reach the critical mass at which things start to change. And when things start to change, they can cascade and change very fast. So let me just give you a couple of examples um, from, uh, and I'll start with examples from my home country, the United States, and then move to more specific education examples. Um, uh, in the United States, uh, well, let, let me start with an example. Uh, of civil rights in the United States. As you all know about the United States, we had a very serious problem in the treatment of African American individuals in which they were denied legal rights for decades and decades and decades. And if you look at the attitudes of people towards relationship between the races, there was a civil rights movement 
trying to change attitudes ongoing, and they put a lot of effort in the 1950s, and they put a lot of effort in the 1960s, and they put a lot of effort in the 1970s. And when you look at attitudes of individuals, for a long time they seemed to only be changing very, very slowly, and then there was just a dramatic shift in which attitudes changed just dramatically in the course of four years, attitudes towards racial things changed by more than they had changed in the previous 40. So you could have said at any given stage, well, gee, we've pushed enough, it's just not going to happen. But that wasn't the right, wasn't the right sort of thinking about it. It was, we have to continue pushing till we we'll reach the threshold. And once we reach the threshold, we can see very rapid and then sustained irreversible progress. Um, now, we have the same example in the United States about education. When I was, <laughs> coincidentally, when I was a senior in high school in the United States, I'll give you time to guess when that was. Um, 1977 is the answer. Uh, 1977, the United States had just barely begun something called the National Assessment of, of Education Progress, the NAEP, which was very much like ASSER. It was a nationwide assessment of what American children in school knew at various ages. And they started that study in order to create the impetus for change and improvement in education practices in the United States. And for the first decade of the NAEP, it showed absolutely no change. And for the second decade of the NAEP, it showed absolutely no progress. And it was only sometime in the third decade of continuous, comparable measurement that all of a sudden you started to see upticks in the indicators. Now, again, cause and effect, hard to know. But having given up early in that process would have left us not with success, but with ignorance about whether or not we were really raising the bar, whether the temperature was really raising. So when I look, I've just completed a study where we look at changes in educational progress over time across all the countries in the world for which we have some comparable data. And it turns out, in about half of the countries for which we have measurements over a period long enough to make, make assessments, about half of the changes are negative. So around the world, roughly half of the countries are still experiencing the kind of deteriorating scores that we see in the ASA result. So it's not uncommon to see this. On the other hand, we are now seeing several countries that after decades of putting careful and precise measurement systems into place are starting to see the enormous returns from it. So Brazil, for instance, improved <coughs> on their measured performance more in the last six years than had gone on in the previous two decades. So again, cumulative pressure eventually accumulated to where you saw very rapid progress. So the, my main point is that I think what ASER is doing is an incredibly important process, but it's going to be nonlinear. We've got to push, and 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 when it starts to happen, it, w it can, in fact, happen very fast, such that we will look back and say the results that went in produced results that were more than commensurate with the effort because we kept pushing long enough to achieve the goals we were searching for. Thank you very much.